Well, good morning. morning. This is wonderful to actually be here in person, as is appropriate and necessary in this time. We all need to do the necessary Facebook and internet creeping ahead of time. I'm sure you've done the same, checking me out, figuring out if, you know, what's going on, Google that guy, any red flags. I myself have been figuring out yourselves, seeing you guys online, but it's great to finally be here, present in your community, seeing it live and in person. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, And on the note of community, one of the things that I absolutely love about this community is your witness to being an intergenerational community. I just want to say a quick note about how wonderful, we all know this, how wonderful the presentation for the kids are, the fact that that there have already been joyful noises to the Lord, uh, chirped and sung from our young ones. We are indeed together the family of God because God has made these secrets known to little children, as it says in Scripture. So thank you for tending to the presence of God by honoring the intergenerational nature of his community. Again, I am so thankful to be here in this community. And it's indeed on the note of community that we speak today. But before we get into that, I'm going to see if our technology device works. Pachow. There we go. It works. Fantastic. Magical technology. Uh, Think for yourselves for a moment. And for this question, I want us to sort of take away our religious brain a little bit. Because I'm going to ask a question, and it's going to trigger some of our sort of religious thinking. But take that aside for now. What is the best news you have ever heard? And again, I know, we talk about good news a lot in the church. And it's okay. It is very indeed good news. But for this example, for this illustration, just a little bit, what's, what's, uh, take that aside. And what's the best news that you have ever heard? Looks like someone wants to answer. There you go. I didn't know how brave this congregation would be. Dorothy. The best news I had was when I was 42, I was told I was pregnant and expecting one of the girls. Amen. And I was told that God was going to Fantastic. How many other Dorothy-like brave souls are there out there who actually want to say, oh, my very own mother. There you go. She- <laughs> that her first grandchild would grow. I can attest to that. Yes, I think you nearly died on the other end of the phone that day. She was silent for a few seconds. We were like, Mom, Mom. Anyone else? If, even just, again, I don't want to put you on the spot. You can think about it just to churn the illustration in your mind. But what is indeed the best news that you have ever heard? You don't have to say anything. Oh, somebody does want to share. There we go. Samara? That's right. We, have, we are just learning names just now. What was the best news you've ever heard? Very nice. Yeah. It was precisely everything you hoped a husband would be. And I'm sure he's lived up to that every single day of his life. We know our wives, of course. We are as perfect and angelic as the first day you married us, right? There you go. Look at the testimony of my wife. There you go. Thank you very much for lying to the congregation. It's a sin, you know. As a sin, sin. John, what's John? Sin. Lying. There we go. And actually, that's, that segues very nicely into uh, my illustration because, of course, one of the things that I think is the common feature of really good news, I'll give my example, actually. My example was, actually, I think the best news I ever heard was I, for years, wanted to go to University of Waterloo. Sorry, I know I'm in sort of foreign territory here, but it's okay. But hang with me here in a second. University of Waterloo for computer science. I just hoped and hoped for years and years. Mom knows, like, it was, like, everyone was saying, you got to go, you want to do computer science? You got to go to Waterloo. No offense to the Guelph program. I'm sure it's great. And it's wonderful. Don't attack me. It's all good. Um, we got to go to Waterloo for computer science. Waterloo, so I, and, I, and, when, and it was Dad, I don't know if you remember the day, but Dad comes up to my room, and he brings this big, giant envelope. And this was in the day when there was actually, for those of you in, say, Gen Z and below, an envelope is a thing that comes in the mail, And it's great. They bring them door to door. It's a physical thing. It's fantastic. But an envelope, a big, and you know how it worked for those of us who who remember the days of acceptance coming to envelopes. Uh, If it was a small envelope, it was was bad news. But if it was a big envelope, it was very good news. So dad comes up and he's like, dad's like, there's something here from the University of Waterloo for you. And I'm kind of like, I look at it and it's a big envelope. I'm like, oh, 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 oh. I open it up and of course it says, you've been accepted. Yeah! 
I kind of, I think, I, I think, I, I don't know if you remember it clearly. I just remember, like, I, I was so euphoric with so many, with so much serotonin or whatever going on there. I was just like dancing around the entire, uh, just so excited. That was the best news that I've ever heard. And I think one of the, and, and speaking to uh, Samara and a lot of other examples here, is that I think some of the best news is one, some of the stuff that we're already anticipating something that we were already waiting for. It's like we're, we're already predisposed to hearing it. So something we've been longing for, waiting for, it happens, and we're like, yes! And even if it isn't something we're already waiting for, sometimes we're surprised by good news, but it's already something that we're already sort of, on, we already like, we already accept. Something like, oh, a fr free lifetime, lifetime supply of ice cream. Yes, I love ice cream. It's something that's already in alignment with our desires. Um, and, and certainly, it would be not good news, and uh, to, to give a counterexample, it would be not as much be good news, at least for me, but if someone were to come to me and say, congratulations, Ryan, you've won a lifetime supply of green beans, I'd be like, well, thanks. I mean, it, it's a lifetime supply, so I guess our vegetable budget will be a bit less, but like a lifetime supply of green beans? Okay, like, it's not something that I already am sort of looking forward to. Green beans are okay, they're fine for us. My mom tried to get us into it. They're great, I eat them with dutifully, but, but it's not good news, even if it's a lifetime supply of it. And I think this is one of our challenges as it comes to communicating the good news of Jesus. We have amazing news in Jesus, but I'm sure this is a lot of your own experience. Sometimes when we share this good news with people, especially if they're, they've never heard the you know, good news of Jesus before, they're completely out of the zone, it, it can almost seem like, from their perspective, you can imagine, it's almost like you've given them a lifetime supply of green beans. Like, they weren't necessarily expecting it. It's like, okay, yeah, you've been, you've been saved by Jesus. Okay, what does that mean? Like, we understand it. But if we take the other perspective, I imagine many of us have had the experience where we share that with other people, and it, we're, it's so, they're underwhelmed by the response. And I wonder it's because the way we phrase it oftentimes is be in terms that they're just not necessarily expecting or doesn't immediately look like good news. It's not that one thing they've been waiting for their entire life. And sometimes we feel like we need to kind of convince them that it is good news, but then again, it's still kind of like, yeah, green beans are great, you know, they're, they're really healthy, and they go well with salads kind of thing. I mean, we feel that way sometimes. And not for as good as bad, not that it isn't good news. I mean, of course, you know, it, it is fantastic news. But, so the question is, I want to look at, I want to observe. So what is, what indeed, well, I'm going to look at this question of the good news. What is the good news? And let us find ways in which we can communicate this to other people. So, so what indeed is the good news? Uh, I want us to start by looking in, our, look in our Bible. If you have your Bible with you and you want to join with, we're going to be in Mark chapter 1. Starting in Mark chapter 1. The very beginning of the book. And it begins like thus. You can watch it on there, but you can also look at it in your passage. And Mark, the, the gospel, the uh, gospel being code for good news. The good news, the gospel of Mark begins this way. The beginning of the good news about Jesus, the Messiah. Oh, well, there it is. It says it in the very first sentence on the first page. The beginning of the good news about the Jesus Messiah, the Son of God. Oh, the beginning of the good news. As it was written in the Isaiah the prophet, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. A voice of the one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight the paths for him. Huh? Again, put your church brain out of it and, and just reading this few sentences here, does this make sense on the surface? I think a lot of us have learned and studied and know understand what the meaning behind this, but the good news about Jesus and something about a messenger preparing the way, uh, making paths straight, like we can see the challenge sometimes, right? Like it's not on the surface, it's not, you kind of have to explain it a little, but on the surface it's not something that people have been waiting for. And this is entirely different. And the thing I want to observe, and this is entirely different from the people that were receiving this for the first time. The people, the Israelites who are receiving back in, you know, the first century AD, they receive this and immediately they read this and they're like, oh my goodness, 
this is good news. And people from our culture who are totally far removed from, the, from what this is, is like, wait, wait, explain it to me. What, what do you mean? Like, you would almost be compelled by their reaction going, oh my gosh, do you understand what this means? They're like, no, no, explain it to me. And so what they might do is bring you back to the very passage that this is referencing. So I want you to notice, so here we go, I don't know how well this is seen. How, are, how is everyone's vision? I have astigmatism, how about you? Um, so we, you can see there's a blue part and there's a green part. These are actually, this is actually a passage taken from two different passages of the scripture. The green part is taken from Malachi chapter 3. There we go. The blue part, did I say green part? There we go, I'm already making mistakes. The blue part is make, taken from Malachi chapter 3, and Malachi chapter 3 says this, I will send a messenger who will prepare the way before me. All right, a reference to them back then. And so what the Israelites might have explained to you is, this is coming from a passage where it says, and it proceeds to say, then suddenly the Lord you are seeking, the Lord you are looking for, the one you have already been looking for, will come to his temple. The messenger of the covenant whom you desire will come, says the Lord Almighty. And they'll say then further, they'll say that green part is actually coming from Isaiah chapter 40. And it's in a verse that goes like this. A voice of the one in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make paths, make straight in the desert the highway for our God. And you might say, well, well what do you mean make straight the paths for the Lord? And they say, well, come further down in that passage, starting in verse 9, I only have verse 10 up there, but starting in verse 9, it says, you who bring good news to Zion, Go high up on the mountain, you who bring good news to Jerusalem. Lift your voice with a shout. Lift it up. Do not be afraid. Say to the towns of Judah, here is your God. See, the sovereign Lord comes with power, and, and, he, and he rules with a mighty arm. So you can see in these passages, there's references to, I should probably just look at it from here, that the, the Lord you are seeking, the thing you are already looking for is coming. Something you're already looking forward is coming. And that's what the Israelites would say. We have been looking forward for someone coming for a long time. Who? The sovereign Lord. The one who rules. And Mark actually makes it a little more clear for us, a little a few passages, a few verses later. So if we go all the way back to Mark chapter 1, we will read a little later in Mark 1, 14 to 15. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God. What is the good news? The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. The thing that they're all waiting for, the exciting thing that was happening, is this. This is an image, a depiction of an, of an ancient king going into a town victorious. They, the Israelites, were waiting for a king, not just any king, a good king. A good king to come into town, to come into their neighborhood and make wrongs right. Change everything around and make it so that they were ruling again. Of course, remember from their perspective as well, they were ruled by the Romans at the time. They were looking forward to a king to come and bring self-determination, their own way of being, in a way that was in alignment with the God who had already saved them. But of course, this is where the translation gets a little difficult for people in our culture. We don't often talk about kings in this time. We do have, of course, we do have a king. Technically, he was coronated yesterday. And, uh, but, but this is not something that we often think about in our culture. And especially when we talk about the kingdom of God, as it said in the passage of Mark, as you see back, it says, the kingdom of God has come near. What does that mean? Again, it risks, if you don't understand, it risks being a little like green beans. So this is what I like, to, this is how I like to say it. Oftentimes we think the kingdom of God means some, means some future heavenly existence. It's where God, it's sort of where God lives and where we'll be with him one day. But actually, as we read in the scriptures, as we read right here, what Jesus says is the kingdom of God had come near. The kingdom of God was at hand. The kingdom of God was right there. It wasn't just some future existence, which we absolutely believe in, that we know that we will live eternally with him, with our king, for those who trust in him, but it was something that had come near, something that was there. How I like to explain it is that the kingdom of God, for those of us who are uninitiated, the kingdom of God is like, we can think about it of the in-chargeness of God. God being put back in charge of the world, of this place, of our hearts. Now, of course, even saying it like that, the in-chargeness of God, 
that isn't necessarily immediately takes it out of the green bean zone, because again, we know how it is as we talk to people in our culture. If you say to people, hey guys, God is in charge now, again, there's so many folks out there who at least have no idea what that might mean, have not been expecting it, and might in fact be a little offended because of what they assume that might mean. We Christians have sometimes done a very poor job of sort of putting out their things, uh, being, uh, putting out their ideas about what it means to be Christian and ideas about our God that puts a very negative light on here. Not to say that I am advocating to sort of oh, withhold the truth, that there is a full truth to be said about what happens to those who trust in him and what happens to those who don't trust. But the thing is, it's, it's a little out of balance for some people and just simply saying, well, God is in charge. My only argument is that it's not immediately accessible. The good news is not immediately accessible to people. And so, and it can come across as not immediately good news. But what if it, what if it, what, what if it was immediately good news? What if there is a way where we could look at the goodness of God and we can say, and let, help people understand that the in-chargeness of God is actually a good thing? And what if we didn't need to contort things or make things just really sort of contort the scripture or hide things? But what if we could just let the scripture be and, what, and present what was hiding in plain sight? What is right there on the surface for all to see about what is amazing about the, about the in-chargeness of God? And this sermon, this thought was sort of inspired by my time volunteering with, uh, we call it the Hope Fa Pregnancy and Family Center in Brantford. It's similar to your Michael house here. It's... It's like a crisis pregnancy center where uh, good news of Jesus is brought through helping women and men in crisis pregnancies. I have had the pleasure of volunteering there every once in a while for the last number of months and so, and it is an amazing ministry to be a part of because you hear and see these stories of, of women and men who are just in a terrible, terrible situation, and yet they come to this place and they feel welcomed. They feel accepted. There is a place to go where they know that they'll be safe and attended to. And what is amazing is that sometimes, sadly only sometimes, is that they get connected to churches who then wrap their loving arms around these folks who are on the margins of society and, and they find a loving community. And the thing that I remember thinking the other day as, we're just, as I was sitting at the center going, wouldn't that be amazing if every single person that came into this place could know that at the church down the street or the church that's connected to that volunteer that connected to that they would wrap their loving arms around them and accept them and love them and be with them exactly how they are at and i and but then i thought and it struck me but that's already the good news that is already the good news of Jesus. And we read about it. It was Carolyn? What was your name? There are my names. I'm getting names. There you go. Praise Jesus for my brain remembering names. It's right there in plain sight, the good news of Jesus. And let's, 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 look, let's look at it again. John chapter 13, verse 34 to 35. A new commandment I give you. There's the reference there. I don't have it on there, apologies. But if you, could, you can listen along, you can read along in your scripture. We're in John chapter 13. A new commandment I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are disciples if you love one another. To, what, and they wouldn't know at that time is that how much he loved them was to die for them was to sacrifice his very life, to humble himself from his godly throne, and to die like a thief, like a slave, so that we all could live eternally, to give up his power so that we might live. That is how much he loved you, and his commandment was for us to love one another. And then don't, let us not, let us not uh, forget that he says, this is how people will know that you are my disciples, because you love one another. And continue on to verse 9 on, on, in chapter 15, as was read beautifully already. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. 
If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I told you this so that my joy may be complete in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. If that truly was who we are, can you imagine how good news that would be? Can you imagine how amazing of news it would be for someone on the margins of society to come into this place and know that the loving arms of one another, pointing to the love of the very Jesus that came to save them, this this person, this who knew that green beans could be so loving? That was funny. Thank you. Who knew that this thing that I didn't know and wasn't expecting all this time could be, what a surprise that I found the love that I've been missing and not having all my life, I could find that in this place, in this community, in this place called church, which I never would imagine a love like this. You see, we talk a good game about love, but imagine if someone were able to actually experience that. Because the kind of love that Jesus is talking about here is not just that kind of airy-fairy sort of... Um, sort of, uh, sort of uh, that you know, sort of empty love. It, it's a real love. Again, it's the love that lays down its life for one another. And that's why I say the good news of Jesus is also is the is the good news of the kingdom, is the salvation from sins. But it's also, but we also have the gospel of spiritual community, the good news of spiritual community. This community has the potential with God on our side, as God supports us and in submission to him to be amazing news for this world. That is not a pose that doesn't uh, shove under the rug the other facets of the good news of Jesus or the warnings about the good news of Jesus, but yet is a demonstration of the very love that Jesus demonstrates for us. And the reason why I think this is amazing news for us and I think we all know this as well. I don't know that I have to spend a lot of time convincing you of this. Is our world is suffering through loneliness, uh, emptiness, isolation, depression, and feelings of anxiety and mental health. All things that are supported through a loving community. And we have seen as f- folks who are further along the journey of life than I would testify that a lot of this has been whittled away over time. And, it, and we see it in the headlines. You see some of the headlines there. Again, this is something I don't know that we have to, I do have a lot of convincing of you. But I just did a quick Google search. You can see the kinds of things the headlines are saying. A recent article in 2023, it's titled, A Kingdom of One, The Great Loneliness Pandemic and What Not to Do About It. Uh, this next headline comes from the CBC. It was during the middle of pandemic, so to be fair, we all understand if people could have felt more lonely than that, but we're still getting over that, right? Like, we still haven't fully recovered. I'm sure you've seen people in your life who are still sort of reeling from the sort of emptiness and loneliness. How many times have you kind of come across your neighbors as we have and said, like, oh, yeah, good to see you again. Man, it's been a, been a slice, right? We haven't really seen each other in the last few years. Like, we've been isolated from one another. Anxiety, depression, loneliness, the highest levels amongst Canadians since early pandemic survey. And if we think that this is just a pandemic problem, I'm sure we all know that this is, goes long before the pandemic. Some, uh, this article from March 6, 2017 says, feeling lonely? Too much time on social media may be why. And believe me, I'm, I just talked about computer science, right? I am like the harbinger of technology. People see me coming with, a te- with, with some sort of device in hand, and they start running. It's like, oh, no, don't bring us more technology. I love technology, and I think it's great and has a lot of important benefits for w- what we do. But, but I'm the first person to say that it's been a blessing and a curse, a little bit of a Pandora's box. Me, the biggest techno adopter that there might be, uh, ha- has seen how our society has become more isolated because of the pressures of social media. To not even speak about what young people are facing these days. If you don't already know, anxiety and depression are way up for our young people today. And one of the factors, I'm not going to place it all on social media, but one of the factors is sort of the, the, the difficulty that, that social media and technology uh, presents in terms of b- allowing people to feel comfortable in relationships and connecting to one another. It's so ironic that we are so connected in one sense, but so disconnected. But again, I don't think I need to express this to many of us because I think we all feel that. 
I certainly felt this in my previous church, and I saw the witness of this in so many different programs where community was made known. We had programs such as youth groups, moms groups, small groups, and you hear the stories about he, how people kind of bring these people together, and there's this incredibly loving and connected sense of community there where people feel like they belong, and even people who are on the journey of Jesus. I was helping lead the youth group at our previous church, and a lot of kids from all sorts of walks of life were coming in droves, and there'd be new kids every week, and kids that were so far from Jesus, they didn't know who Jesus was, and we were t talking about him, and they'd be okay with us talking about him, but they still felt that this community that we had, that God through us had sort of cultivated, that they found this light in the good news of spiritual community. And lest you worry and be concerned that I'm the type of folk that's going to say, well, just community for community's sake, and you know, we, can, we need to sort of minimize sort of the Jesus part of a community, let's just be loving together and hold hands. No, no, no. I'm talking about the gospel of spiritual community, a gospel of, commu a gospel of kingdom community, a community that, has, that honors Jesus, the coming king, coming into our world, into our lives, and in submission to the king, we create this community which has some elements that will be very accessible to our culture and certainly some that are going to be, un some that are be uncomfortable. Even Jesus in his day in bringing his kingdom made people a little uncomfortable. But they found that the benefit of what he was doing was, was bringing them to something deeper, more authentic, and more in line with the order of his creation. And so let's look at that. What indeed do I mean by spiritual community? What, what exactly could that mean? What does that look like? How is that different or similar? Or what does that look like from a, from a biblical perspective? Now, each one of these points could be its own sermon itself. So I'm just going to give a high-level overview and sort of tease you with, maybe more later. Um, but let's look at the final passage that, uh, that we had read for us. Carolyn had read. It's your name, right, Carolyn? There we go. And we're still remembering there you go. Thank you for praying for my brain. Let's look back at this passage, Romans chapter 12, verses, she read 9 to 16. It's because I took mercy on the scripture reader. There was already a lot of verses there, but we're going to go all the way back. If you're following along, you're going to notice I'm going all the way back to verse 3. Um, and so let's look at this line by line and see what it says about what spiritual, not just any community, not just loving one another, but true spiritual, king-honoring, Jesus-submitting community looks like. So Romans 12, verse, starting in verse 3. For by the grace given to me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. Immediately. Again, it's a little bit of a different way of a spiritual community is a, spiritual, a community of humility. This is not good news for the people who are not humble, for the people who want to use community for their own gain. And yet we're submitted to the king. We are submitted to Jesus. We're humility. Where the good news is that that person on the margins doesn't have to feel like they're coming in as less than. That they are equal to each and every one of us because God loves them just as much as they love me. If, 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 there's, not any, if there's any illusions about that, like you are all equal to me. I hope we all know this. I trust we all know this. That though I might have the title pastor, it doesn't make me any more special, any more close to God, any more connected. We all are one. We are all unified. You are teaching me as I'm teaching you, and there's a mutuality in who we are. That is spiritual community. Not dictatorial reign over some ruler, as benevolent as you might think I am. I've got my, you know, iron fist moments, of course, and Diane will tell you. So you go, we got to watch. we got to sharpen one another and be humble and submit to one another. That is spiritual community. Verse 4 to 5. Oh, I'm not going to tease it yet. Verse 4 to 5, for just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to the others. There's unity and diversity. We have many gifts, and the many gifts are given to us to build one another up. And each person, even the person who would think themselves lowest, the least of these, have something to offer and is given a gift to build one another up, that we are all mutually in this together. That is spiritual community. That's the good news of spiritual community. Verses 6 to 7, we have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then to serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If to encourage, 
then encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is a lead, do it diligently. If it is show mercy, do it cheerfully. So verse 6 to, six to 8, that's an error. Verse 6 to 8, show that, we, show that we build one another up. Unity and diversity, and we build one another up so that we might, be given, might be stronger together than we are separate. Verse 9, love must be sincere. Hate what is evil, cling to what is good. And this is referencing back to what I was saying before. It's sincere love. It's not that I love you that was said by someone who had hurt you before and they said that to manipulate you or to get something out of you. It is sincere love. And this is a point that is going to be a a challenge for all of us because we all say we love one another. And I don't know about this community, but I know it's a challenge for many communities where we're often sitting in the same room, but it's like we're all sort of isolated in the same room. We come, we float in and out every week, but we don't necessarily know one another. We don't necessarily have sincere love for one another. Look at the person, but well, maybe don't look at it. Use your eye, because that's awkward, right? To look at the person next to you. So maybe just turn your eye next person and say, do I sincerely love this person? Do I desire to sincerely love this person? It's a challenge, right? It's a little uncomfortable. This is the uncomfort of doing spiritual community under the king. And yet, if we were to realize this, how good of news would that be for this world? All right. Verse 10. Oh, wait, no, I'm going to read it first and then give away the goose. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourself. It's along that sincere love lines, devotion to one another. Can you imagine if someone someone in the world who was far from Jesus came in here and realized how devoted you would be to them in their needs, in their sorrows, in their pain, in their joy? that you would be there through thick and thin, that is good news. I know, Gabby. Maybe not good enough news. Verse 11. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Oh, verse 10. Sorry, I was going to say, too, there's a mention of self-sacrifice. It was uh, honor one another above yourself. Self-sacrifice. Along the same lines we're talking. We're going to move on to that next uh, thing. I'm forgetting my own order of things. Here we go. So verse 11 and 12, as I just read, be faithful in hope, patient affliction, faithful in prayer. This is where we model the fruit of the Spirit. We know the fruit of Spirit. Galatians 5, love, joy. There's a song, by the way. Some of the kids know it. And boy, is it a great song. Maybe everyone will learn, because, you know, we're all learning from the kids, right? Maybe we'll all learn a song. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Anyone know it? Anyone? It's good. You'll learn. It's fine. The, the love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, all these wonderful attributes that come not from our own power and our work, but from the Spirit working within us, we demonstrate this to one another. And imagine coming to a community where love, joy, peace, patience, these are all demonstrated. That is good news. Verse 13, share with the Lord's people who are in need. We'll stop there, and we have justice. Justice for the poor, for the people who are on the margins. Sharing with whoever has need. Imagine someone who comes who really is in need, someone perhaps from a crisis pregnancy or someone just off the street. Imagine the good news of knowing that we are a community that share whoever has in need. That is justice. That is God's justice, and that is good news. And, of course, verse 13 continues to say, Practice hospitality. Hospitality, welcoming all in. Verse 14. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Again, this is one of those uncomfortable ones. Because reconciliation and being and unifying with one, th- those who we see as our enemy is perhaps one of the hardest things that we do. But when we do it well, and when do we do it in submission to God, we demonstrate the capacity for love that is perhaps beyond our own power. And indeed, that's a little bit of a theme that I'm going to pick up a little bit later. Beyond our own power, by the power of the Spirit. But let's continue on. Verse 15. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. We support one another in the highs and in the lows. And of course, finally, verse 16. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Again, it's that equality that I talked about before, coming in with living in harmony with one another. If a community could truly express all of these, oh boy, that would certainly be good news. 
the in chargeness of God, when God is in charge of a community, when his kingdom has come to a community, that is amazing news. And yet, it is hard. Oh boy. Thinking about what we could be and where we are now, and again, not knowing where you are, you're probably far along on a lot of these, but like any community that where sin is a part of our lives, where uh, we are tempted to move along the way of the dark side and to go by our flesh, to uh, submit to our, our own desires, our own will, by the accusation of Satan that would be saying you want to do things this way, that way, selfish, you want to get your own, take, you know, get money, uh, don't be humble, puff yourself up. If we submit to those messages, we can't do it. We can't do it on our own power. It's incredibly hard. Is it impossible? No, not when God is in charge. Not with the in chargeness of God. Not with the kingdom of God. The gospel of the kingdom is the gospel of the spiritual community. Exactly what Mark was talking about in here. The thing that might have looked like green beans at first is in fact the thing we have been, that this world might be looking for all this time. I think this is amazing news we can bring, but it starts with us. It starts with us demonstrating it here and welcoming people into that. So let us be that, Priory. Let us be together a community that submits to the will of God, that deepens our faith so that we are completely in line with the Spirit, that out of Him and His power within us, we show love to another. We show sincere love to one another. We show humility. We show equality. We show self-sacrifice and justice and hospitality and reconciliation. When we do that, that will truly be good news here in Priory Park to Guelph and to the rest of the world. Amen.